Good afternoon, everyone. I warmly welcome all of you to the earnings call of Hema's Holding PLC. In the call with us today, we have our Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Kasuri Chalraja Wilson. She's joining remotely as she is currently overseas. We also have our group uh, Chief Financial Officer, Moiz Rehmanji, Hazel Pereira. Uh, Director, Group Finance and Treasury, and Ishani Ranasinghe, Head of uh, ESG and uh, Corporate Communications. During the call, we will be discussing uh, about financial and operational performance, group strategy, followed by ESG and, uh, and a Q&A session. Here's a over to you. Thanks, Dilushi. So before we move on to the performance for this quarter, let's have a quick glimpse of the macroeconomic factors and how these affected our group. So we did see that the NCPI slowed down to 0.8, uh, but uh, the food inflation uh, did experience a negative uh, figure. So uh, this slowdown is a bit less than what has been anticipated. On a more positive note, uh, the currency appreciated and of course, our group being a net importer uh, in terms of home and personal care atlas and the pharma segment did uh, benefit from this. And then moving on to the global commodity prices, there was significant decline compared to same period last year in the global commodity prices. And this benefit has been passed on to the customers in the first half of this year. So simultaneously, the interest rates have also come down uh, compared to the period uh, start of this financial year to today. Uh, the AWPLR has stabilized at around 14%, which is about a decline of around 7.5%. This uh, decline also compared uh, in com combination with the working capital decline that has been experienced has been a positive impact to the group. Unfortunately, the tax reforms uh, continue to impact the wallet sizes of the consumers. This combined with the electricity, fuel and gas continue to have an effect on the buying pattern of the consumers. So on a more positive note, uh, we see that the DDO has been completed and the country is in expectation of the second tranche of the IMF. Uh, so, with this in mind, so uh, Moise, uh, let's begin with the review of the overall market performance. Uh, shall we start with HPC, please? Uh, so, HPC, it's been quite interesting. There's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of how uh, the volumes have been tracking and, you know, how consumers have been spending as well. Uh, more or less, we can say that the market has really not ex recovered in terms of volumes to, the ex to what we expected. But there are, again, some positive signs that it is on a, on a turning point where we should see some improvements coming in the next few months. And even in the current quarter, all the overall, these are what the stats and the figures tell us. Uh, there are a few silver linings as well in terms of volumes, as the, even though overall the picture is not as... Uh, great as we initially anticipated. But again, the good news is we see the sentiment turning around. We see that there could be more volume improvements and growth coming along in the next few months and quarters. Uh, there, is, there is obviously pressure on uh, price reductions coming in on certain categories. For example, in the laundry category, we do see some price pressures. But on the flip side, you know, there are a few uh, categories that we are in that we are able to command pricing as well. Uh, Mastage is something that we are seeing very much out there in the market, uh, where we see consumers prepared to spend on certain categories. Uh, although we are conscious that uh, cost of living, it's taking its toll. Uh, it started its, its course somewhere in the latter part of last year with the devaluation. And then, of course, the taxable the taxes on incomes where ties of people's wallet sizes have been shrinking. Uh, we know that VAT is uh, poised to increase in quarter four from uh, up to eighteen percent. So these are things that we are watching and we are cautious about. 
but that said, uh, again, like I mentioned at the beginning, there's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of uh, where there's pressure, where there's volume impact, and where there's growth for uh, where there's potential for growth and uh, opportunity to price also competitively where we can sustain our margins. Uh, going specifically into some of our uh, categories, Santry napkins, uh, the baby category, shampoo, we've seen market size, uh, market, other market share growth uh, during the quarter. And again, I touched on, you know, some of the beauty categories, which uh, personal care categories that come into the whole mastic space, the Vivia, the Prasara, uh, we've seen very good traction. Growth has been quite impressive compared to uh, the previous where we launched most of these at least the last 18 months. Uh, Baby Share Me, of course, the highlight, one of the highlights we've had uh, in the court is that uh, uh, Baby Share was awarded uh, the best baby care brand in the detail category in the Global uh, Brand Awards of 2023. Um, so thank you. Uh, so what are the key developments that we uh, witness in the stationary market and uh, how did Hemas face this challenge? So station to give some more, more context, uh, there is a comparative of what it was last year. Last year, Hemas did have a distinct advantage because uh, uh, due to the, the financial crisis, you know, we were able to sustain and continue service in the market with our products and get the supply chain going. This year, with import restrictions uh, being more relaxed, uh, we do see the market getting more competitive because all the previous entrants and even new entrants are now coming in. Uh, but with that, there's a lot of space for competing on the VFM uh, uh category which is the value for money category and along those lines we've launched we, we've got one of our brands which is home run which is doing a good job in terms of picking up on that particular space of vfm uh we've also uh seen that although uh as you all know this is a highly seasonal uh industry station which revolves around the whole school calendar as well so uh, even though the first staff has been relatively sub subdued due to seasonality, uh, the second half of this year, starting from Q3, which is the quarter that we're in, uh, the volumes will pick up for the next uh, school cycle, and we are seeing that pick up. Uh, and you would see that in the subsequent quarter results that we're reporting. Uh, so that would be pretty much in a, in a nutshell what the whole station learning category has done for the group during the, the quarter that we just concluded. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, so continues to face economic pressure. So how has HEMAS improved and how has HEMAS navigated these particular challenges? All right, interesting. So Bangladesh is today uh, where possibly Sri Lanka was 15 or so months ago, but not to the same extent. Uh, for example, they are seeing high inflation, but what they call high inflation is 9% compared to what we saw. 80% at its peak. Uh, their currency has devalued, but again, around 10% or maybe less compared to what we saw. But that said, these are pressure points within the country, which is causing its challenges. But we have been managing quite well in terms of our revenue has not been so impacted. The good news on Bangladesh is some of the new products that we launched about 15 or 18 months ago, specifically uh, the soap, which is Actisef. We've seen it show double digit growth on the, on the top line. Uh, we also launched a recent uh, uh, variant of uh, the oil category, which is the Colombo Pure Coconut Oil in Bangladesh, which is also seeing good traction. So uh, Bangladesh is, is going through a bad patch right now. There is unrest over there and we are watching it, but uh, the impact is not as severe as it was in Sri Lanka a year ago. And again, the, the good news, the silver lining is that what we are launching as new is doing well and is getting good traction over there. Uh, yes, then let's move on to Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka as a country continues to face challenges in the healthcare space. And it's a sensitive topic to the public as well. So has this situation improved? Um, there that, are that, that two sides to this. Uh, in terms of uh, what we read about in the media as to what's going on with the, with the state, the shortage of uh, medicines and all the, the controversy around it, 
Uh, we, we've seen some recent changes in terms of the whole appointments within the state sector, which will hopefully be good news. But has that really sparked an improvement or a turnaround yet? The answer is no. Uh, in terms of uh, the brain day, the migration, again, there is no positive improvement over there. But what we do sense and see uh, as a bit of light at the end of the tunnel is when we talk to the doctors and consultants, we do see some uh, comeback of our patients in seeking uh, uh, private care uh, services versus where in the previous quarter we saw quarters, we saw uh, the football from patients shift away from the private sector and you know possibly going more into the stake sector due to the uh, the the price, I mean the the affordability pressures. But uh, we are seeing signs of a turnaround there, which is which is positive and a, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but that said, uh, it's a bit too early to really conclude that uh, the spending power of patients in terms of healthcare uh, being being squeezed and being pressured is behind us. The signs, the turnaround signs are there, but it's a bit too early to conclude. But uh, we're optimistic and looking at you know this area that as uh, healthcare as an area that we can look at in the future for growth. So amidst these challenges, uh, how has our healthcare sector performed? So shall we start with our pharmaceutical now? Sure. Uh, well, as usual, uh, like with most other things, there is a decline in terms of volumes, but there's always uh, there's always a bit of a silver lining in the current environment. The rate of decline in terms of volumes we are seeing come down. So they, the decline continues, but the rate of decline is reducing, which is good news. The key challenges, of course, are on the pricing. As you all know, uh, with, the, with the exchange fluctuation in the last 15 months, uh, pricing has been something that has been outside of our control entirely, and it, 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 do, it does bring quite a bit of flux in our performance. So the recent 16% uh, mandatory reduction uh, has had an impact on our PL on our margins, on the pharmaceutical business. Uh, apart from you know what it does to our ongoing margins, because the 16% reduction was uh, pegged to a, a dollar rate of 2.95, and as you all know, the last few months the dollar has been hovering between 2.25 to 2. Uh, sorry, 3.25 to 3.30. Uh, so that has an ongoing impact on margins, and that, apart from that, there's a one-off impact on the inventory that's in the pipeline, which is a distributor stock. And uh, the pipeline impact is a one-off which has taken its toll on our margins in the first half, especially in quarter two. Uh, so those pressures remain, uh, but what we are really pushing for is a implementation of a price formula in time to come, and hopefully that will create much more uh, visibility and predictability around our p &L, financial performance and margins. Uh, with regard to our own uh, uh, internal facility, the manufacturing, uh, vertical that we have. Uh, as you all know, we launched a few products in the in the diabetes space, which uh, even uh, quite a quite a dominant position in terms of uh, market share in the first half. And uh, we've also taken up uh, simpler sub uh, subcontracting manufacturing uh, in this uh, first half, which also caters to diabetes. The good news is. That the plan that we commissioned a few years back in Homagama, uh, in terms of its capacity fill, it is picking up. Uh, we have actually ended the quarter at about 50% uh, capacity fill, uh, and we expect the average capacity for, for this year to be in the range of about 30 to 40%. So that's a good news that the, the plant is now uh, picking up the capacity, and obviously. Uh, that you know flows directly to the bottom, bottom line because the investment, uh, the cost of the investment is already fully factored into our PNL. So moving on to hospitals, uh, what are focus areas and what are the key developments we see in hospitals? Yeah, I, I, I sort of uh, touched on this in terms of you know, patients coming back to the private healthcare, but to give a few to give a few specifics, uh, occupancies at a range of about. Uh, sixty percent, which is the good news. Uh, we continue to anchor on our specialties, which is the uh, nephrology, the cardiology, and also the gastro side, uh, which is an area that continues to grow and it's an area that we have had a competitive edge in, and we continue to to focus more on that area. Uh, of course, as you all uh, 
the opportunities in terms of expansion out there, not just uh, inorganically, but also organically. Some of our facilities, for example, Talwatu, where there's so much of scope to expand over there, the land is also uh, there that we that we intend to get to further expand our bed capacity. So our investment in uh, healthcare, specifically in hospitals, is something that we're looking at quite optimistically and positively, and uh, uh, we'll need to see how things transpire on that end. Uh, but the opportunities out there in the healthcare space, especially, especially on the hospital side. So could you discuss the performance of the mobility sector as well and how it contributes to the overall strategic direction of the company? Yeah, on that side, um, there, is, there has been pressure in terms of uh, volumes, uh, but there is a gradual pickup that we see on the, on the exports and also with the relaxed uh, relaxation on the the, imp the, the import restrictions uh, and with the Pakistan and India cargo volumes growing, uh, there is opportunity, there is, there is an upward movement in terms of volumes. There are pressures in terms of financial performance due to uh, the dollar denominated uh, revenue booking in that segment. Uh, I mean, compared to where we saw the dollar being at the beginning of the year, uh, the rupee has appreciated compared to that. So that's only impact, if at all, that we see in that uh, segment. But in terms of volumes, it's looking uh, good. And of course, on the passenger travel, as you know, globally, and it's no different in Sri Lanka, it's picking up steam quite significantly. Uh, the same way people spent on with vengeance three years back on products, now they're spending, uh, the, the, the reverse is happening now, where they're spending more on travel and uh, services. So that's uh, helping our uh mobility sector as well uh given that we are the the agents for hybrid so that's a good use of that side um so looking at all these macro challenges the market behaviors both positive and, and negative uh could you elaborate how these factors translate to the company's profitability both year on a year on year basis and quarter on quarter basis sure is it? so let's 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 bring the let's change gear and bring the number story behind uh uh, the business side of it now. Um, on revenue, there's been growth. Uh, the growth has been quarter and quarter as well as year and year. Uh, and that's helped significantly by inflation, uh, although the impact on volumes have been there. Now, question is how that revenue growth transcends to our bottom line. Uh, you, do, you do see some improvement on the GP margins, which is good news. Uh, but it's not necessarily at the same pace of the revenue growth because there's been uh, impacts in terms of inflation, although there have been some RM uh, raw material cost benefits, uh, uh, the inflation on overheads, and of course some pressures on the selling prices to our consumers. I mentioned earlier the, the specific example of uh, uh, pharmaceutical price reduction of 16%, uh, and of course there's some price competition in certain categories such as laundry, those price impacts have, have had an impact on a margin despite improvements on, on the RM cost of it. Uh, where that sort of further withers away towards the bottom line at EBIT level is uh, number two, number one, the inflation on the overheads itself, which takes its toll on our performance. Uh, the net finance cost uh, has remained relatively high, uh, but that's on the back of where we started the financial year, uh, where we started the financial year with uh, high gearing. Uh, and, and the impact of that is what is uh, giving rise to the high finance costs compared to the previous year. But uh, the benefit of the interest rate reductions is something that we are seeing, uh, or the person necessarily reflect on our PL again due to the starting high base of uh, high gearing that we entered the financial year into. But the benefit of the interest cost reduction is something that we are seeing. As you all know, the AWPR has had, had dropped in quarter two to around 14.5% uh, versus the 20 plus percent that we saw early on. Uh, as we speak in quarter three, it has dropped even below 14%. So these benefits, you'll see more of it kicking in in quarter three. Uh, but again, perhaps not to the extent as it may seem at, at face value, because you started the financial year with a high high gearing level. Uh, but that said, um, as you mentioned, or let, or let me just come to that point a bit later. I'll just finish on the PNL. Uh, on the tax side, there is some improvement you see. Uh, that's predominantly around dividend tax, uh, which we had last year, but we do not have 
this year. There are a few accounting adjustments as well in terms of different tax uh, that has resulted in improvement, but it's been mostly around the, the dividend tax that we see an improvement. And all of it flows into the bottom line. There's an improvement of uh, 4.7% compared to the previous year, uh, but not as much as you know we would ideally like it to be given the top line growth. Capital employed remains fairly similar to what it uh, was uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, there's been a slight, somewhat of an imp uh, increase in the in the borrowings. That's pretty much due to the the long term, the medium to long term loans that we took for our investment in the 24% stake in Atlas. Um, and uh, if I were to just go on quarter on quarter, there's again meaning quarter one versus quarter two. There is a marginal growth in revenue. Uh, there's an improvement in the GP margins. Uh, so the benefit of whatever productive improvements that we're driving is seen there, but again, not uh, to the extent uh, of uh, uh, what it could have been if uh, these price pressures were not there. Uh, earnings has also improved quarter on quarter due to reduction in, in finance costs. And uh, what I would really like to focus on a bit more now, uh, since uh, I just finished on the PNL is on a working capital and the balance sheet, uh, which is uh, something that we alluded to in, even during our previous investor calls, that last year was a year that we had to invest heavily into working capital growth to keep the business going and to keep the, the, the market serviced. And it was successful in that sense. But the flip side of it was the growth in our debt levels, which again is something that we started off with this year. But now that business is normalizing the banks, the financial sector is normalizing, availability of credit is normalizing. Uh, we mentioned in our previous calls that the focus this year from a cash flow standpoint is to start recouping some of the working capital back. And you could see that in our balance sheet, the working capital has improved by about one to one and a half billion rupees. And to that extent, you can see the debt levels also coming down. It has not come down uh, as much as our investments have been. Uh, but there is a net reduction, uh, and of course, I mean, there has been a net increase, uh, which is a net of, you know, the additional loans that we took for acquisition, minus the debts that we repaid due to working capital improvement. Uh, so there's been overall a, a decent working capital improvement in the first time. You can see that in our cash flow as well, uh, where there's a, a good positive operating cash flow, even in comparison to our operating profits, versus a highly negative cash outflow that we saw in the previous financial year uh, so that would be pretty much uh, on the on the balance sheet side what has changed uh, uh, would you like to touch base on the EPS as well yeah the EPS has also shown improvements uh, during the year and and that stems from you know the whole improvement and the the picture that I mentioned uh, on the BNL so things such as income tax, uh, has given us some headwind uh, reduction in the, the the minority interest component that was previous impact our PNL has uh, has obviously reduced due to uh, acquisition in the in the Atlas stake. Operating profit has improved for reasons that I mentioned already, but there's been a, a net impact uh, from the finance cost going up again because we start the financial with uh, high gearing levels. Uh, what I would also like to touch on is uh, uh, if you look at a PNL, there is also fairly high impact coming from our uh, share in our associate company, which is the leisure sector that we have. So this is an impact that we did not see last year, although the impact did exist, and that was as a result of uh, how we were asked to account for this last year by auditors versus how we are asked to account for it this year. Uh, so this year we need to account for the full impact of that. And if you were to take that out from a performance of a core, uh, which is all our main businesses, excluding leisure, has done even better than what it uh, did last year. If you take this particular line item out of our leisure impact. Okay. Um, so what are the main reasons or the actions that help the group to maintain strong results, especially given this volatile market condition? Well, I would start off with uh, Hazel talking of the strong governance that we have and the team behind that governance. Uh, it's a quite uh, uh, a diverse 
team that we have that have come from various industries, uh, various different companies that have come together in you know, leading uh, uh, the businesses from the individual SPU exposed to the group level board of, board of management as well. Uh, we continue to have a strong balance sheet. Our net gearing is still around 15%. And that's a strength that we hold on to despite the increase in gearing that we took in the last financial year. Uh, the defensive segments that we play in continues to be the strongest uh, card that AMS continues to have. Uh, consumer goods, uh, healthcare, the strong brands that we hope the we, we own in the different categories, the strong brands that we're newly introducing in the personal care space, the strong distribution network that we have, a strong stakeholder relationships with uh, both internal and external. Uh, the different uh, partnerships that we have. These are all things that play very strong for HEMAS and they continue to do so. We grew impressively last year despite the economic turmoil in the country and uh, the goodwill that comes from all these uh, uh, factors of industries and uh, our partnerships continue to help us uh, into our culture as well. And I, 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 I need to also mention uh, in, in line with uh, our strong balance sheet, uh, AAA rating from Fitch, uh, all of this plays into what our strengths are, and you know, it continues to help our performance uh, uh, as we go along as well in the current financial year. Thanks so much, Royce. So moving on to Ishani. Uh, Ishani, could you give us an update on the company's efforts uh, related to all environmental and social issues and how these initiatives affect both business and the large community at hand? Go ahead, though. Thanks. Um, so, firstly, I want to say that while we did these initiatives, we continue to monitor our relevant uh, ESG topics, and this was done to identify and manage any risk the business may face. And, uh, then when we looked at our environmental initiatives, uh, this quarter, we focused on offsetting our plastic waste that is sent to the market. So, one of the key initiatives we did is we formed a partnership with EcoSpindle, where we created two material uh, recovery facilities in Palambo and Ampara. And the focus here is annually, we will ensure about 350,000 kilograms of plastic is uh, disposed responsibly. So through this, uh, through the overall plastic offsetting initiatives, we have collected close to 190,000 or more than 190,000 kilograms of plastic. Then from a social perspective, uh, HEMA's Outreach Foundation uh, partnered with Hoppers London to tackle malnutrition in children. So for that, uh, we distributed uh, nutrition packs to over 1,097 families and children uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, across 33 PRS pre preschools in 11 districts. Then uh, one of our key uh, initiatives is our peer preschools, which is done to ensure that no child is left behind and it's focused on early childhood care and education. So we opened a preschool in Kegon, uh, and this will be our 63rd peer preschool that has been added to the national network. Then if we go on to look at our purpose projects, one of the key aims we've been looking at is our Say Yes to Life campaign that we have looked at to tackle diabetes. And we have done 3,000 diabetes tests to external and internal stakeholders. And this has been done free of charge. Then our Her Foundation has looked at tackling period poverty. And while we AYA has been giving affordable sanitary napkins, we've also looked at creating awareness on menstrual health to over 12,000 women. Then two of our Atlas projects, we've looked at creating uh, equal learning opportunities as well as quality education experiences. And for that, we've done seminars, trainings, and done relevant donations to over 74,000 children. Uh, then just to look at two, two other projects, uh, one of the things we have focused on is creating safer world through our Baby Sheremy, one of our flagship brands, our Nettie Mask Consumer. So we have conducted parental clinics on uh, creating a safer world to over 4,000 families. Uh, so that's it from us. So thanks, Ishani. Um, so <clears throat> Moise, moving back to you, could you uh, shed some light into what will be our corporate and business priorities for HEMAS uh, in the future developments we anticipate in the quarters to come? Uh, all right, so 
we are on the lookout. I mean, we are we are always uh, as a conglomerate, we are wanting the opportunities out there. And uh, needless to say, uh, the growth that we intend to get into uh, will entail MA as well. So we'll get uh, the opportunities that we can find along those uh, lines. Uh, digital is is a buzzword that is out there, and it's uh, it's no different to what we are also doing around it. Uh, the whole digital transformation that we need to now bring to the organization. Uh, we've been running on SAP for ten plus years, and how we really harness it and maximize the ROIs on existing investments and rationalizing what new investments we need to make to really get the whole digital transmission drive going and reaping the maximum benefits out of that is an area that we're looking at. Uh, now that the business has grown to the size that it is, you know, 100, uh, we were 117 odd billion last year in terms of revenue, which was the size of the growth and we expect to see growth this year as well. Uh, it's a very large business. It's a very large portfolio. And uh, as a conglomerate, this is a perfect opportunity we now have to really look at strategic cost savings because uh, as a group there are advantages that we can leverage on which we need to now really start uh, squeezing out uh, in terms of liquidity as we look at growth and m and into the future we need to uh, unlock as much capital within the system which is all about the working capital management whilst we have a strong uh, balance sheet a very strong watches that we can leverage on for m and uh, we need to try minimize the finance cost, minimize the leverage by unlocking as much cash as possible from the working capital. And that's where that whole uh, push comes from. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what are the really, the, the, the business side, what we're looking at on the consumer side, is basically focusing on the personal care, which is where I mentioned earlier as well. There's uh, opportunity to grow, there's opportunity to uh, grow with healthy margins. The beauty and wellness is an area that uh, is obviously worth exploring into its the unpenetrated uh, opportunities out there, the markets as well. Uh, the value proposition we offer with the existing products, the purpose behind the products and the brands uh, is something we really want to get to further uh, improve and grow our, our market share. Uh, the, digi the digitalization and transformation that we want to drive from the center uh, needless to say, it's going to uh, have benefit, maximum benefit on uh, some of our clusters more than the others. Consumer is one area that we really want to bring in the efficiencies through the digitalization. And of course, the export and I, was, I should say last but not least, the export opportunities that we have. Uh, it's an area that we're really looking into quite strongly, the international business. Uh, we have a dedicated team, a dedicated structure, dedicated leadership to drive that whole effort. Uh, there are certain markets that we are looking at, uh, apart from South Asia, where we can be released, we're looking at uh, East Africa uh, and kind of manufacturing export opportunities come by way of ODM as well as OEM. Uh, this is a quite promising new space that we're getting into because we realize that we need to increase the, the dollar representation in our business, in our revenue. Uh, it, it brings its own sets of edges and advantages to our total portfolio. And it's an area that we're really investing to, we're really investing resources into right now to really make it grow uh, for time to come. In terms of from the healthcare side, it's about uh, building more of our Morrison brands by capitalizing on uh, the facilities and the infrastructure that we have right now and uh, the launches that we are working on to create more uh, more dominance in the whole uh, brand of generics in the, in the private uh, healthcare segment. Uh, the new business uh, opportunities that are out there uh, in terms of all the agency, adjacencies or the diagnosis businesses that we want to get into, uh, area that we want to uh, invest into. And also on the hospital side, we have a couple of specialties I mentioned earlier, uh, the nephrology, uh, and those are the spaces that we want to further anchor and further consolidate into whilst we expand on the hospital business again I, I shed some light on it in my previous sections there's growth out there uh, in organic as well as organic within our existing uh, facilities and of course the digitalization that I mentioned at the group level I mentioned for the consumer sector same applies to the, the healthcare as well uh, it's an area that we can really use to drive further working capital improvement and Working capital is an area that uh, has an impact more on our healthcare segment than it has on our consumers. So 
using digital to really drive that improvement with, backed up with process improvements is something that we're working on the healthcare piece as well, in addition to the whole business growth side of it. Yeah, thanks, Moise. Um, before moving on to uh, uh, Q&A, uh, Kasri, would you like to add any thoughts? No, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it has been a um, tough quarter which we came through, but I also would like to uh, address saying that you do also um, see the note, you must have seen the notice that uh, I'll be stepping down from an executive role from 31st March and moving only to a sole non-executive role at Hamas. I'll continue with Hamas. And um, some might have reached out and asked why, because uh, I guess uh, the opportunity were kind of made sense because for me, I wanted to learn a bit more about the global market. Secondly, I wanted to give back to the country. It helped me do both. But from a company's perspective, I need to tell that um, we are in a great place. Um, our foundation is strong. Our strategic, uh, we've done our LRPs for the next three years, which is uh, done by the MDs and our leadership. We've got a very strong leadership team. And uh, over the last three years, we've kind of, got our collaborate, we collaborate together and our digital pieces have helped us to work closer together. So on that front, there is no, um, there's not going to be any issue. I think they're only, they're poised to grow further than, uh, the, than the last three years. Um, and we're very strong in what we're going to do in terms of how we're playing. So strategically, we are very clear on how, what we're going to do. So basically that's my part of it before you all ask the questions I thought I'll state that as well um yeah and I'll I notice a lot of questions but uh, I think Hazel you can moderate that yes Kastri so uh, let's start with the question that says is there a government buyback agreement and uh how much sort of is it and how is it sort of benefiting the business is one question we have so I mean I think uh person who has been with Hamas for the last uh, so many years would have known. I we, we had a buyback agreement, which we renewed in 2019, I think, or 20. Uh, but having said that, the problem we had is it was not getting honored the way it should be. Uh, purely because Hamas does business ethically, we do not uh, engage in influencing anything which should be asked in, in certain ways. Uh, so currently, um, that's the reason you saw Morrison pivoting to our own brands. And I, I'm glad we did that because we see great success in that. Um, so buyback is there. We do get, we don't push it. We do give it, we do honor, we do supply the government now on our terms. Purely when um, the other suppliers fail on quality or on quantity, we, we step in. Otherwise, it's not going to be a key. It's not a huge, uh, it's not priority for us. Our priority is to build our own brands. Uh, another question going in the line of, uh, would there be any adjustments to the gasseted farmer prices in the short term? Uh, so the when uh, the farmer price reduction came, they put a 16.5% reduction. That was a new pricing committee who actually, uh, this is the fundamental problem in Sri Lanka. They keep changing regular committees and uh, heads of uh, institutions. Then the, the legacy knowledge gets, tacit knowledge gets lost. So when they gave a price reduction, they didn't understand it meant that it was bringing the exchange rate up to 295 when the rate was hovering at around 330. That correction has been, in, been, we have been influencing or we have been speaking about it and uh, um, the new pricing committee or the previous pricing committee came to a point of saying yes and then there was a change of the head and uh, now there's a new pricing committee. Um, so the new pricing committee understands it. It has been now recommended. Then the minister changed and now the minister has to look at it. So to answer your question, the topic has been addressed, but I only hope that the consistency, there's going to be a minister to execute it and the same pricing committee can uh, fire, put their case forward. Uh, and the rectification they're suggesting is only to bring it up to the exchange rate for at CIF to bring it up to about 325, I think, about 10 to 12 percent is what they are uh, suggesting. Yeah. Um, there's another question. It reads uh, two questions regarding margins. First one is uh, why is the healthcare segment business margin contracting? 
and also uh, the operating margins of the consumer segment has improved. So, any thoughts on that? Yeah, healthcare sector, Kasri just answered that question in terms of the price reduction that has been enforced without taking into account the correct exchange rate. So the current, the recent price reduction was on pegged on a 295 exchange rate, whereas the market rate has been hovering around 220, 325, 330. And that's something I mentioned earlier as well in during my slides. Uh, regarding consumer segment margins improving, uh, it's, it's about the commodity prices also coming down. There's been improvement in our supply chain management in terms of better negotiations of prices. Uh, so the price pressure from the selling price is there, but it's about, you know, what's the net gain that we gain uh, from the pluses and the minuses and net net we have gain on the margin side, despite the price pressures being there from the consumer side. Um, thank you. So uh, there are two questions uh, regarding future investments. Uh, one question is, uh, is there a plan to increase, uh, sorry, is, is if uh, m and is something that is on the cards for the group, which segment is most likely to have such a transaction? And the other question reads, is there any plans to acquire hospital? So, I mean, uh, we have been very consistent in where we will deploy capital for growth. The growth is to unlock value or create capacity and unlock value. Um, capital is allocated for our consumer businesses and in the healthcare, it will be allocated to hospitals. That we've been very clear. Um, whether it's hospitals through acquisitions or our own expansion where the time is right, the capital is allocated. Uh, consumer uh, businesses, whether it's learning or, or um, the HPC, it would be to getting into a new category or getting into a new market uh, is something we look at in terms of acquisition. Um, I think Moise touched upon this question, uh, but nevertheless, any particular reason why the health, healthcare sector finance costs is not showing a significant decline despite the interest rates coming down? Yeah, so I'll just uh, state it. Uh, uh, healthcare sector includes pharmaceuticals, and that's an area that we had to invest heavily on working capital in the last year due to the financial crisis. And uh, the incremental rearing and debt that we took due to the working capital uh, investment is what was brought forward in the current financial year as of 1st April 2023. And uh, although there's a benefit from the interest rate reductions due to the quantum of the debt that we started the year with, uh, you will not see a finance cost reduction on that segment. But as we, as you have seen, the the, the debt levels and the working cap, or rather the working capital improvements are visible, are seen in a balance sheet. And with that, there is debt reduction happening and interest rate uh, reduction further taking place in the current quarter. So the benefit of all of this will really start playing in, in the second half of the financial year. Thank you. And uh, there's one question regarding the Morrison Manufacturing Plant. Uh, it reads, did the uh, new Morrison Manufacturing Plant uh, reach the break-even capacity? Yes, the answer is yes, it has. But break-even is subjective depending on what category you're producing to this plant. Is it our own brand or whether it's one of the subcontract uh, brands for the government tenders? But, uh, or, or it's a mix of, you know, it's, it's a right mix between the two. So we have hit break even, and it's to see how we can further ramp it up with the growth of our own brands, which is something Kastri also alluded to as an area that we're focusing on with the uh, Morrison facility. Um, that's all the questions that are appearing in the Q&A tab. So if uh, anyone would like to uh, raise any question, uh, this would be the time to do so. Um, in the absence of any questions, uh, Kastri, would you like to give any closing remarks? Uh, just thanks everyone for the support and uh, mm -hmm. uh, confidence placed in us. Um, we're looking for a, to go forward to good uh, next two quarters and uh, we'll see you in the next quarter. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for joining and have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.